Laws and regulations. In this section, we will discuss the most important laws and regulations that you'll need to be aware of to keep your dealership compliant. The subjects will include Truth in Lending Disclosures, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Consumer Privacy, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, IRS FinCEN 8300 Form, OFAC and the Patriot Act, Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, Telemarketing Rule, Do Not Call Registry, Can Spam Act, and the Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act that includes the Red Flags Rule. Each law will be an overview of the law and the reference will be made to the website for each so that you, you can easily review the law completely if you choose to. Let's begin with the Truth in Lending Disclosures under Regulation Z. In general, disclosure is required before any closed-end credit transaction is completed. With, within the F&I office, the installment loan contract qualifies as this type of transaction. An exception exists where credit is extended over the telephone or by mail. In these cases, the disclosure may be made after the fact. The term closed-end credit transaction is defined by exclusion. That is, includes any credit arrangements, either consumer loan or cr credit sale, that does not fall within the definition of an open-end credit transaction. Open-end credit includes credit arrangements like revolving credit cards where the borrower, that is the credit card holder, is not required to pay off the principal amount or buy any particular point in time. Rather, the borrower is simply charged interest periodically and is usually required only to make a minimum payment. Under Regulation C, disclosure may, must be made in the following important credit terms. Finance charge. The finance charge is the cost of consumer credit as a dollar amount. It includes any charge payable directly or indirectly by the consumer and imposed directly or indirectly by the creditor as an incident in or a condition of the extension of the credit. It does not include any charge of, of a type payable in a comparable credit transaction. Annual percentage rate. This is the measure of the cost of the credit, which must be disclosed on a yearly basis. Amount finance. The amount finance, using that term and a brief description such as the amount of credit provided to you or on your behalf. The amount finance is calculated by, one, the principal loan amount or the cash price subtracting any down payment, two, any other amounts that are financed by the creditor and not part of the finance charge, and three, any prepaid finance charge. Total of payments. This includes the total amount of the periodic payments by the borrower. Total sale price. This is the total cost of the lending requirements, that is, the total of payments plus the down payment. Finance contracts must be retained for at least two years after the date of disclosure. Disclosures must be clear and conspicuous and must appear on a document that the consumer can keep. The consumer is entitled to receive a copy of the agreement even if they are not signing off it at the time. So if they request it, you have to give it to them. The penalties for failure to comply with the Truth in Lending Act can be substantial. A creditor who violates the disclosure requirements may be sued for twice the amount of the finance charge. Cost and attorney's fees may also be awarded to the consumer. A lawsuit must be filed by the consumer within a year of the violation. However, if a creditor sues more than a year after the violation date, violations of the Truth in Lending Act can be asserted as a defense. Fair Credit Reporting Act. The Fair Credit Reporting Act is designed to promote accuracy in consumer reports and to ensure the privacy of the information in them. FCRA prescribes standards for the information shared by businesses that is used to determine eligibility of consumers for credit, insurance, or employment. It imposes requirements for accuracy in consumer reports, establishes consumer rights in relation to his or her credit report, limits purposes for which such information may be used, establishes 
disclosure requirements for accuracy in consumer reports, including furnishes of information, and includes civil criminal penalties for a credit report in the reason for denial of credit, insurance, or employment. Consumer privacy. There are two recommended steps for dealers to address privacy. First, keep current on legal requirements through your legal counsel and professional organizations. And second, familiarize your dealership employees who have contact with the public or with customer personal information about privacy practice and requirements. F&I managers should read the consumer privacy statements for the following reasons. Number one, educate employees and suppliers of privacy issues and requirements. Number two, providing for physical, managerial, and electronic security of personal information in your dealership or re retail facility to ensure that personal information is reasonably maintained and secured, including encryption of credit card data. Number three, limiting access to consumer personal information to employees who have a legitimate business need to access personal information. Number four, obtaining agreement from third parties to whom you provide personal information to similarly protect that personal information such as information technology, suppliers, and advertising agencies. Fifth, establishing a process to address customer concerns about the way personal information is being handled, handled excuse me, at your dealership. And number six, provide customers with a privacy statement about how your dealership handles their personal information. An important aspect to consider as a finance manager is how to handle a customer's credit bureau. More specifically, is it okay to discuss a customer's report with them after you have pulled it? According to the FTC, it is acceptable to discuss the customer's report with them regardless of whether adverse action has been taken. It is not acceptable to give them a copy of their bureau. If they have been turned down, they are entitled to a free copy within 30 days of the notification by the consumer reporting agency that has turned them down. In addition to the statutory rules governing re consumer reporting agencies, if any user of a consumer report takes adverse actions such as denial of credit or increase of credit charges with respect to a consumer based in whole or in part on any information from a consumer, that user must Number one, provide oral, written, or electronic notice of the adverse action to the consumer. Number two, provide to the consumer orally, in writing, or electronically the name, address, and telephone number of the consumer reporting agency, including a toll-free telephone number established by the agency if the agency complies and maintains files on consumers on a nationwide basis that furnish that report, and a statement that the consumer agency did not make the decision to take the adverse action and is unable to provide the consumer the specific reasons why the adverse action was taken. Is the dealer ever responsible to send the customer an adverse action le letter? Yes. The Seventh Circuit Court found in the Treadway versus Gateway Chevrolet Oldsmobile decision in 2004, even a casual discussion about credit with the consumer could create a time when the dealer has to notify the customer of adverse action. In this case, Gateway Chevrolet took a credit application from a customer, but instead of submitting the application to the bank, they just requested that the, that the consumer provide a cosigner. The court ruled that Gateway should have notified the customer of that adverse action.
Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, GLB Act. The Financial Modernization Act of 1999, also known as the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, or GLB Act, includes provisions to protect consumers' personal financial information held by financial institutions. There are three principal components to the privacy requirements. The Financial Privacy Rule, the Safeguards Rule, and the Pretexting Provisions. Under GLB, the FTC implemented the Financial Privacy Rule concerning financial privacy policies and the Safeguard, safeguard Rule concerning administrative, technical, and physical safeguarding of personal information. First, we begin with the Financial Privacy Rule. A company's obligation under the GLB Act differs for consumers and customers. A consumer is an individual who obtains or has obtained a financial product or service from a financial institution for personal, family, or household reasons. A consumer is a, a, a customer, excuse me, is a consumer with a continuing relationship with a financial institution. Customers are entitled to receive a financial institution's privacy notice annually as long as the customer relationship lasts. The privacy notice must explain how anyone who receives non-public personal information from a financial institution can use or redisclose the information. If the consumer has no opportunity to opt out, the service provider cannot sell information to other organizations or use it for marketing. The second privacy requ requirements under GLB is the Safeguards Rule. The Safeguards Rule, effective May 2003, was put into effect to design, implement, and maintain safeguards to protect consumer information and develop a written information security plan that describes the program for protecting consumer information. Five required elements of the plan. Number one, designate a program coordinator. Number two, identify risks that are reasonably foreseeable. Number three, design and implement safeguards. Number four, control outside service providers. Number five, evaluate and adjust your plan. Assess the risk in your dealership in, number one, training, employee training. Number two, employee management. Number three, information systems. Number four, information systems manager. Number five, other dealerships areas. And, and finally, number six, control and management of these areas. Controlling the risk identified in the dealership assessment. Number one, designing safeguards. Number two, implementing the necessary steps. And number three, regularly testing your controls, systems, and procedures. A company and its related operating entities have created a plan to review the handling practices identify possible risks to consumer data, and then manage the risks for the consumer privacy. As part of this plan, you are being asked to review this notice and to agree to abide by the items set forth herein, procedures set up by the company, and the various rules and regulations set forth by the Act. Examples of personal, non-public information include, but are not limited to the following. Customers' names and addresses, credit card numbers, lease agreements, credit applications, social security numbers, VIN or vehicle identification numbers, credit reports, and then lists of customers. No personal, non-public information shall be disclosed, downloaded, distributed, copied, or otherwise transferred by verbal, oral, print, or electronic means to anyone outside of the employees or agents of the company and its related operating entities except and unless such disclosure is authorized disclosure such as disclosure of information to a financing source. In addition, any and all efforts will be made to ensure that such personal non-public information shall be kept secure at all times from direct or indirect disclosure to any non-authorized third party. All documents and files containing personal non-public information shall be kept secure in areas with controlled access and should be locked or otherwise secured when not in use. The third and final privacy requirement under GLB 
is the pretext, pretexting provisions. Pretexting is the practice of someone getting your personal information under false pretenses. Pretextors sell your information to people who may use it to get credit in your name, steal your assets, or to investigate or sue you. Pretexters use a variety of tactics to get your personal information. For example, a pretexter may call, claim he's from a survey firm, and then ask you a few questions. When the pretexter has the information he wants, he uses it to call your financial institution. He pretends to be you or someone with authorized access to your account. He might claim that he's forgotten his checkbook and he needs information about his account. In this way, the pretexter may be able to obtain personal information about you, such as your social security number, your bank and credit card account numbers, information in your credit report, and the existence and size of your savings and investment portfolios. Keep in mind that some information about you be in a matter of public record. It may be in a matter of public record, such as whether you own a home, pay your real estate taxes, or have ever filed for bankruptcy. It is not pretexting for another person to collect this kind of information. Under federal law, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, it's illegal for anyone to under false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements or documents to get customer information from a financial institution or directly from a customer of a financial institution. Also, use forged, counterfeit, lost, or stolen documents to get customer information from a financial institution or directly from a customer of a financial institution. And finally, ask another person to get someone else's customer information using false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements or using false, fictitious, or fraudulent documents or forged counterfeit, lost, or stolen documents. Equal Credit Opportunity Act. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act, ECOA, ensures that all consumers are given an equal chance to obtain credit. However, this doesn't mean all consumers who apply for credit get it. Factors such as income, expenses, debt, and credit history are considerations for creditworthiness. The law protects you when you deal with any creditor who regularly extends credit, including banks, small loan and financial companies, retail and department stores, credit card companies, and credit unions. Anyone involved in granting credit, such as real estate, brokers who arrange financing is covered by this law. Businesses apply for credit are also protected by this law. When you apply for credit, a creditor must not, first, discourage you from applying because of your sex, race, age, national origin, or because you receive public assistance income. Second, ask you to reveal your sex, age, race, natural origin, or religion. A creditor may ask you to voluntarily disclose this information, except for religion, if you're applying for a real estate loan. This information helps federal agencies enforce anti-discrimination laws. You may be asked about your residence or your immigration status. Or third, ask if you're widowed or divorced. When permitted to, to ask marital status, a creditor may only use the terms married, unmarried, or separated. The ECOA also requires lenders to notify applicants within 30 days if their loan application has been rejected. If adverse action is taken, the lender is also required to provide the name or office, address, and phone number of the credit agency from which the statement of reasons can be obtained. If the denial was based on information found on the credit bureau report, the applicant is entitled to a free copy of their report within 30 days of the notification. IRS FinCEN 8300. This law was enacted to address the problem of money laundering. In short, if a dealership receives more than $10,000 in cash in one transaction or in two or more related transaction, it must file Form 8300. Any transactions conducted between a consumer or their agent and the dealership in a 24-hour period are considered related transactions. Transactions are considered related 
even if they occur over a period of more than 24 hours, if the dealership knows or has reason to know that each transaction is one of a series of connected transactions. It is important to note that cash includes U.S. and foreign coin and currency received in any transaction. Cash also includes cashier's checks, money orders, bank drafts, and traveler's checks having a face amount, amount of $10,000 or more, or excuse me, or less, that is received in exchange for a vehicle. The exception in this provision occurs if checks or drafts are, are the proceeds of an installment loan. It does not include personal checks regardless of the amount. Form 8300 must be filed voluntarily for any suspicious transaction for use by the IRS, even if the total amount does not exceed that $10,000. Suspicious transactions are defined as transactions that appear as if the consumer is trying to avoid filing that Form 8300 or filing an incomplete or false form. This term also includes any transaction in which there is an indication of a possible illegal activity. Form 8300 must be filed by the 15th day after the cash was received. If the date falls on a Saturday, a Sunday, or a legal holiday, the form may be filed on the next business day. A copy of this form must be retained for five years following the transaction. In addition, you must give a written or electronic statement to each person named on a, re on a required form 8300 on or before January 31st of the year following the calendar year in which that cash was received. The statement must show the name, telephone number, and address of the information contact within the dealership. Uh, also, the aggregate amount of the reported cash received and that the information was reported to the IRS. You may be subject to penalties if you fail to file a correct and completed Form 8300 on time. A minimum penalty of $25,000 may be imposed if the failure is due to an intentional or willful disregard of the cash recorded, re reporting requirements. OFAC, the Patriot Act. To begin, the two terms listed above do not represent the same things. OFAC stands for the Office of Foreign Assets Control. This office is part of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. As such, it administers and enforces economic and trade sanctions based on U.S. foreign policies and national security guards, goals excuse me, against targeted foreign countries, terrorists, international narcotics traffickers, and those engaged in activities related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The Patriot Act is the legislation that requires businesses to verify that prospective customers are not on the OFAC list. While many companies provide this service, there are a number of websites that allow you to run an OFAC check for free. Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. The Magnuson Moss Warranty Act is the federal law that governs consumer product warranties. Passed by Congress in 1975, the act requires manufacturers and sellers of consumer products to provide consumers with detailed information about warranty coverage. In addition, it affects both the rights of consumers and the obligation of warranters under written warranties. Let's first address what the Magnuson Moss Act does not require. First, the Act does not require any business to provide a written warranty. The Act allows businesses to determine whether to warrant their products in writing. However, once a business decides to offer a written warranty on a consumer product, it must comply with the Act. Second, the Act does not apply to oral warranties. Only written warranties are covered. Third, the Act does not apply to warranties on services. Only warranties on goods are covered. However, if your warranty covers both the parts provided for a re repair and the workmanship in making that repair, the Act does apply to you. How about what the Magnuson Moss Act requires? The Act requires three basic requirements that may apply to you, either as a warrantor or a seller. First, as a warrantor, you must designate or or title your written warranty as either full or limited. Second, 
As a warrantor, you must state certain specific information about the coverage of your warranty in a clear, single, and easy to read document. Third, as a warrantor or seller, you must ensure that warranties are available when, when your warranted consumer product products are sold so that consumers can read them before buying them. Next, let's turn to what the Magnuson Moss Act does not allow. There are three prohibitions under the Magnuson Moss Act. They, they involve implied warranties, so-called tie-in sales provisions, and deceptive or misleading warranty terms. Implied warranties are unspoken unwritten promises created by the state law that go from you as a seller or merchant to your customers. Implied warranties are based upon the common law principle of fair value of money spent. The three prohibited under Magnus and Moss begins with a disclaimer or modification of implied warranties. The act prohibits anyone who offers a written warranty from disclaiming or modifying implied warranties. This means that no matter how broad or narrow your written warranty is, your customers always will receive the basic protection of the implied warranty of mer merchantability. The implied warranty of merchantability is a merchant's basic promise that the, the goods sold will do what they are supposed to do and that there is nothing significantly wrong with them. In other words, it is implied, it is implied promise that the goods are fit to be sold. The law says that merchants make their promise automatically every time they sell a product they are in business to sell. There is one permissible modification of implied warranties. However, if you offered a limited written warranty, the law allows you to include a provision that restricts the duration of implied warranties to the duration of your limited warranty. For example, if you offer a two-year limited warranty, you can limit implied warranties to two years. However, if you offer a full written warranty, you cannot limit the duration of implied warranties. If you sell a consumer product with a written warranty from the product manufacturer, but you do not warrant the product in writing, you can disclaim your implied warranties. These are the implied warranties under which seller, not the manufacturer, would otherwise be responsible. But regardless of whether you warrant the products you sell as a seller, you must give your customers copies of all written warranties from the product manufacturers. How about the prohibiting of tie-in sales provisions. Generally, tie-in sales provisions are not allowed, such as a provision would require a purchaser of the warranted product to buy an item or service from a particular company to use with the warranted product in order to be eligible to receive a remedy under the warranty. While you cannot use tie-in sales provisions, your warranty need not cover use of replacement parts, repairs, or maintenance that is inappropriate for your product. The final Magnus and Moss area that is prohibited is deceptive warranty terms. Obviously, warranties must not contain deceptive or misleading terms. You cannot offer a warranty that appears to provide coverage, but in fact provides none. For example, any warranty covering only moving parts on an electronic product that has no moving parts would be deceptive and unlawful. Similarly, a warranty that promised service that a warrantor had no intention of providing or, would not pro or, or, or could not provide would be deceptive and unlawful. Telemarketing rule. In an effort to address a growing number of telephone marketing calls, Congress enacted in 1991 the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, TCPA. The TCPA restricts the making of telemarketing calls and the use of automatic telephone dialing systems and artificial or pre-recorded voice messages. The rules apply to common carriers as well as to other marketers. In 1992, the Commission adopted rules to implement the TCPA, including the, re the requirement that entities making telephone solicitations institute procedures for maintaining company-specific do-not-call lists. On July 3, 2003, the FCC revised its TCPA rules 
to establish, in coordination with the FTC, or Federal Trade Commission, a national do not call registry. The national registry is nationwide in scope, covers all telemarketers, with the exception of certain nonprofit organizations, and applies to both interstate and intrastate calls. The registry went into effect on October 1, 2003, and is administered by the FTC. To reduce the number of hang up and dead air calls, consumers experience, the, the Commission's telemarketing rules also contain restrictions on the use of auto dialers and requirements for transmitting caller ID information. Do not call registry. After October 1, 2003, the FCC prohibits a telemarketer from initiating a telephone solicitation to anyone registered on the National Do, Do Not Call Registry, with exceptions being made for consumers who have given prior written consent to receive such calls and calls having a personal relationship with the consumer. An established business relationship is defined as one where the consumer has entered into a transaction with the telemarketer within the past 12, 18 months, excuse me, or where the consumer has made an inquiry, just an inquiry within the past, or excuse me, within the prior three months. A telemarketer may not, under any circumstances, call a consumer who is requested to no longer be called and no longer receive phone calls from that company. In other words, Company-specific opt-outs may apply even if the company meets one of the exceptions. Dealers or retailers are responsible to have procedures in place to honor such requests. Additionally, the telemarketing rule requires that sellers must keep records for two months for all advertising material and scripts related to its telemarketing activities, including but not limited to names, addresses, and other information of all current and former employees directly involved, as well as all records of expenses, excuse me, rather, all records of express written consent of consumers to be called. CanSpan Act of 2003, controlling of the assault of non-solicited pornography and marketing act requires unsolicited commercial email messages to be labeled though not by a standard method, and to include opt-out instructions and the sender's physical address. It prohibits the use of deceptive subject lines and false headers in such messages. The FTC is authorized but not required to establish a do not email registry. State laws that require labels on unsolicited commercial email or prohibit such messages entirely are preempted although provisions merely addressing falsity and deception would remain in place. The, spam, the Can Spam Act took effect on January 1, 2004. Spamming is defined as sending or initiating the transmission of unsolicited commercial email. The simple translation of the anti-spam law is that if, if you're sending out emails from a dealership to attract prospects, make sure that, number one, the email has something clearly marked within the subject line that identifies your message as an advertisement. And secondly, within the email, there is an option for the recipient to, to opt out of any future emails. Finally, make sure to check your state's laws regarding emails and spamming.